You've probably all had a rough week. Heard some stories of staying up late and getting up early, pulling calves, hauling them in the barns. But you woke up early today anyway to prepare to come to church. What for? I don't know if you saw the title of this message today. If you did not read it in the bulletin or saw it on the screen just yet, take a note of the title. Asleep in church. I remember being little and loving the long prayers of the pastor because I could nod off and be okay in the eyes of everyone around. I wouldn't get in trouble. The longer the prayer, the better, I thought. Please let's turn to Acts 20, verse 7. I catch a few of you sleeping once in a while in church. And it seems the ones I don't catch actually apologize to me for sleeping after the service is over. You know, I know I've been guilty of sleeping in the past. I've been in church trying to stay awake before when my eyes feel like 10 pound weights. It's not like I could hide it or anything. Pretty soon my head would start to jerk, bob, and then as sleep took over my body would do that, those telltale switches, twitches. It's horrible. You know, but I did find the best way to deal with this tiredness. It was to open up the Bible and just hold it like I was reading it. Now that worked almost every time till it slipped down on the floor and kathunk. Then I really jerked from waking what I thought it was for a com was a comfortable bed to a snickering congregation. You know, I have so many stories about sleeping in church. But none tops the one that we're reading this morning out of Acts. In Acts 20, starting with verse 7, On the first day of the week we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and, because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and picked up dead. When Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive! Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. He had quite a wake-up. It is thought that by the name used for, for the word young and the name of Eutychus, that this young lad could have been 14 years old. He could, he was a slave, he could have been a slave that worked all day and then came to this meeting to hear Paul. You know, Paul was interesting. Paul was the, the one accused that was turning the world upside down. He was, he was the, the one that, that had all the stories, interesting stories. Eutychus may have heard Paul describe the time when Paul was going and preaching the gospel. And going and... and uh, no, no. He might have been hearing Paul talk about when he was converted. When Paul was going to Damascus and he was going to drag some of the believers that were trusting in the way, he was going to drag them to court. He may have even been wanting to kill them. And then Paul gets struck by light. And he, he falls off his horse and he hears the words of Jesus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul says, who are you? He says, I am Jesus. And Paul, as he's blind, he, he gets led to the city of Damascus and Ananias touches him. And he receives his sight and he's baptized. And pretty soon, instead of being a persecutor of the way, the, the way's worst nightmare, he's the one that's proclaiming this Jesus. He's the Savior of the world. You know, the stories that Paul talked were powerful and Eutychus was just bringing it all in. 
You know, maybe hear the gospel that Paul preached. You know, that Jesus Christ came. He lived this life. He was from God. God sent Him. And He died on the cross for our sins. That anyone who believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, as Paul was declaring this gospel in that third room floor, he may have recalled the time that as he was proclaiming this gospel, that he went to these towns like, like, uh, like, like Iconia, or Iconium, and uh, Lystra, and they thought that Paul was like a god, Zeus, or, and uh, were trying to worship him because they they. They healed the lame man. And then right after they did that, and they said, no, we're men just like you. They got The mob got stirred up and they stoned Paul and they left him for dead. And Eutychus might have been daydreaming and thinking he was such a man. And then as he fell, you know, you ever, you ever, you ever get in a dream? And your dream comes reality, you hear some words, and then all of a sudden, you know, it enters into your dream and Eutychus falls. And he may have even dreamed that he was lifted up like Paul into the third heaven and hearing words that man is not permitted to write down or express. And then he wakes up. Eutychus! He's alive! He's alive! You know, he may not have written the book that heaven is for real. But through this event, we understand that the resurrection is for real. You know, this was a great way to end this meeting. Wow! You know, this is the climax, right? But they went back upstairs and they, and I don't know if they, they ate bread or not before, but they broke bread and they ate. And Paul could have taken the clue, you know, this guy almost fell to his death. But instead of sending them all home, Paul talks until daybreak. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 16.1. They came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Like I said, I don't know if they break twice, broke bread twice, or if it was not until after Eutychus slept and was brought back to life that they finally broke the bread and ate. But there's some elements of this gathering that we can capitalize on. This is an example of a meeting held on the Lord's Day with the Lord's people having the Lord's Supper listening to the Lord's message and observing the Lord's power. All these elements were present at this gathering. Why the first day of the week? It could be Sunday was the day that Paul was available to speak. You know, Paul would say, okay, mark this day. Save a room for me. This day, because I'm traveling through this this region, this day, and I'm going to be moving on to the next city. This day is the time I'm going to be there, the first day of the week. Mark it on your calendar. Reserve a room for me. I'm going to be there. Paul went from synagogue to synagogue normally preaching on the Sabbath day to the Jews earlier in his ministry. Could it be that there was some unmentioned transfer from the Sabbath day that, that God said to keep the Sabbath day holy from the Old Testament to the new day, Sunday, the Lord's Day on Sunday, to be the official day of worship in the church? And we're, we're gathered here today on Sunday, right? This isn't the Sabbath, the traditional Sabbath of the Jews. This is the first day of the week. In Revelations, we, we have John. He was worshiping the Lord on the Lord's day when Jesus Christ came to him and spoke to him. And then we have this passage in 1 Corinthians 16 that Paul brings up the proper collection time should be on the first day of the week. 
In verse 1, Herbert, chapter 16, it says, Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. You know, did, did the tradition, our Sunday tradition for, for coming to church on Sunday, did it, did it start with really no big explanation? You know, Paul didn't write down there and says, and the transfer was all made from Sabbath to Sunday because now that's the day the Lord rose from the dead. Well, we don't have that explanation. But the first day of the week is sensible. You know, we should start off every week in worship to our God and honor Him with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart. We should start every week with the good news, encouragement, and realignment to God's way. We should start off every week with fellowship and sharing of the good things that God has done to us during the week. That, and, that He provides. We should start off every week in the power of the Holy Spirit to raise us up to a new life in Christ, to be like Him. You know, let's turn to Colossians 2, verse 13, please. You know, what a way to start off the week, right? You know, how many times have you gone through the week and, and you remember the song and it, it was in your head all week long? Yes! You know, make me a blessing. May that be on your, in your tomb box all week long. Make me a blessing, Lord. But what a way to start off the week. Sunday should be like a starter in a car. You know, it's that, that little motor that gets the big engine running. You know, you know, you know the car doesn't drive off the starter. Of course, I've done that before, you know. It doesn't go very far off just the starter. But that's what Sunday is about, is to get that big engine going, to get the Holy Spirit's juices, if you will, flowing through your body, to live the Christian life. You know, the real worship happens out there. The real good works happen tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the day following that, outside of these walls. After today. You know, I can almost guarantee that Eutychus, his engine was started. I mean, he was ready to roar from that Sunday experience. You know, like Eutychus, we all are as good as dead before the Lord takes a hold of us. Now let today be the day that God makes you alive and gets you wrapped up for the days ahead. In Colossians 2, verse 13, it says, When you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authority, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that are to come, that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The reality is found in Christ. You know, I think the traditional... The, the traditional day for NASCAR is Sunday. We, we, we have anybody NASCAR fans out there? <laughs> I'm not a NASCAR fan. <laughs> but we have some NASCAR fans. Gentlemen, start your engines. Is that what they say? Yeah? Gentlemen, start your engines. I, I, I don't know. Big BB boys here. They imagine. Gentlemen, forget it. I'll try it some other time. 
Okay? You, you get the picture though. Today is, should be like NASCAR Sunday where we start our engines. May we be, have our spiritual NASCAR today and every day till we, till we start again. The important thing is not the day though. The reality is found in Christ. He is the one that brings the engine to life. Christ's resurrection power is in you. It's in you. The Spirit fuels that engine to keep you going. But let's not forget about each other. That upper room, that third story room, wasn't just Paul and Eutychus. It was a gathering of God's people where they met and they heard the message of God. They, they, they experienced God's power. And they broke bread together. They had fellowship with one another. Please, let's turn to Romans 14, 1. God's people met regularly. Every first day of the week was what Paul said, that, that they were to meet and make those collections. Sometimes they even met daily. I've, I've told of a pastor before that, that, uh, that went out and visited one of his attendees that quit coming to church. And he didn't say anything. He just, he just knocked on the door, the person let him in, and he just sat in front of the heart. And there was a glowing heart there, he's cold, and he just wanted to warm himself up. But then he took that old poker, and he started spreading out the embers. They moved the embers away from each other. And he just sat there and watched them as each ember started to get darker and darker. And pretty soon they were getting cold. And then he pushed them all together again. And he watched them as they one by one warmed up. And when, it, when he could feel the radiant heat again, he just got up without saying a word and walked out the door. And the next guy, that guy was, next, next Sunday, he was back in church. The pastor was, and so was the guy that he visited. But we need each other. And sometimes when we come together, the sparks fly, right? But do not stop fellowshipping with God's people. Being a Christian without church is, being, is like being a soldier without an army. We need each other. We have, we're in a battle. Satan is fighting for our souls. We need to watch each other's back. We need to encourage one another. We need to build one another up. We need our support. We need each other for rebuke, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, and for encouragement. It's all part of getting raised to life after that death fall. That we're all a part of. We all sin. And we need to be lifted back up. We're members one of another. And each of us has a job to do with the body of Christ. Like, like like members within our own bodies. Can't do without each other. And we need to be first and foremost to be the reality of Christ to those we are with. In Romans 14, 1, it says, Accept Him Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another's man, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. 
and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You know, this little assembly of believers in Christ, we house the power of the resurrected Lord. And we are here as God accepts us to accept each other. You know, there's so many disputable matters. We're all different. We all got different ideas about days, about what we eat. And, and you know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that, that, that we can dispute. And those things we could just lay aside. You know, the things that are indisputable, like Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That Jesus was perfect. That, that, that there's only one God. You know, these things that bring us together, they're indisputable. And they hold us together. Then we focus on those things. In verse 8 it says, if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that He might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. And you're living for the Lord. Please, let's turn back one chapter to Romans 13, verse 11. This event where Eutychus fell asleep in church is an example of a church meeting held on the Lord's day with the Lord's people, having the Lord's Supper, listening to the Lord's message, and observing the Lord's power. That's church. What are you doing church? Or are you asleep? You know, I'm not talking literal sleep. There's a wife who apologized to the pastor after the service was over and her husband, she apologized for her husband because he just got up and walked out the door. And the pastor says, yes, it was, it was pretty disconcerting. And the wife says, yeah, he's having a pro he had a problem with walking in his sleep ever since he was a child. <laughs> Don't be a sleepwalking Christian. Especially do not be a walking dead Christian. There are lots of emotions to go through, days to observe, gatherings to be a part of, and even works to perform. They can become so much of a routine, so much me focus, so much, you know, what do I look like in front of people that they forget to focus on Christ. And they forget the life and the connection with life. And they're walking around dead. You can do it in your sleep or you can walk and worse yet, perform them while you're dead. In Romans 11, I mean Romans 13, verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come from for you to wake up from your slumber because the day because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with with the Lord Jesus Christ 
and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Live. There was a, I had a track kid this yesterday, and uh, you know I'm not going to say any names, but they they end up cursing a little bit. We nailed them. And said, you know, you can't do that. But in the process of doing this, I, I, I told them, you know, you can stop doing this, but there's a there's a, there's there's a there's another option too. Instead of this negative, turn it into a positive. <laughs> Bless your run. <laughs> Bless your activity. And, and the next time he got out the activity, he goes, <laughs> you know, and he and he went. But it was a positive thing. And that's what we got to do with our lives. Yes, so we got a problem with our, our sinful nature. We get, we get jealous. We get prideful. You know, we, you know, and the list goes on. But it's not enough just to quit them. Because then you're still dead. You need to live and take on the Lord Jesus Christ and begin acting like He acts. Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope that the words of God were enough to keep you all awake this morning. But more than that, to bring you to life. May it start your engine to move from today in the power of the Spirit throughout this week. In the newness of life. You know, if there's anything that shows that the sign of life to its full extent, is love. Love equals life. And looking back to the to the three verses before the passage we just read, I want to go back to, to verse 8 in Romans, 11, or Romans 13, verse 8. And it brings it to life. It says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be, are all are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. You got your engines roaring? Is it, is it there? Do this. You know, God is love. He loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son and he didn't just give him. He took our place. He died on the cross. Love was so great. And Jesus' love was so great that that that, that, that old grave couldn't hold him. You now Eutychus raised from the dead, but Jesus Christ. He was the first one to raise to eternal life. He's the first fruits of the dead. And that love, that power, can be inside of us to raise us up to new life in Christ. Believe in Him. Entrust your life to Him. Let His love permeate your life and break out from the real death to real life. New and abundant life in Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, as we go from this place, Lord, I pray that You go with us. Lord, this, Lord, this place, this wonderful place where we cry out to You. Lord, let it be the starter 
of our engines as we go out into the, to the race, the rat race of this world. Lord, perform in us what we cannot do. Lord, break us into, break out our death into life so that when others see us, they see you. Lord, it's this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.